No. What's the difference between straw and hay? Cattle and poultry. <laughs> to sow and to plough. You'll learn some farming and agricultural vocabulary in this episode of... <laughs> Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig. Welcome. If you're a new listener, my name's Craig. And my name's Reza. And with over 45 years of teaching between us, we're going to help you improve your grammar, your vocabulary, your pronunciation, your idioms, and all aspects of your English and take it to the next level. Hi, Reza. How are things, Craig? Things are great. Things are great. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, I must say. I love this time of year. Spring is in the air. Spring is in the air. It's a beautiful, beautiful day here in Valencia. And before we begin speaking about farming and agriculture vocabulary, we're going to listen to a voice message from Tanya from Ukraine, who is living at the moment in Spain. And uh, here's Tanya's voice message for you now. Hello. Um, I'm Tanya. I'm Ukrainian, but currently I'm living in Spain. Well, because I'm married here and I am an English teacher, a teacher of English. So I also teach um, people. And uh, honestly speaking, well, I started, first of all, I started to listen uh, to your postcards uh, just just not long, not long time ago. But honestly speaking, I am in love with them. And thank you a lot. Really, thank you a million. And uh, in fact, there are a lot of questions I would ask you, to ask you. But probably the first one, and probably the most important one, is uh, the one that um, very often my students ask me. This is probably what could you recommend me and probably my students? What is the fastest and the easiest way to learn vocabulary, English vocabulary. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you very much for, for sending us your voice message. I especially liked your expression, thank you a million, that you used at the end. You said, thank you a lot. Thank you a million. Obviously, thank you a million means thank you so much, so much, so many times. And uh, that's a lovely expression. And thank you, Tanya, for listening to us. Uh, so, vocabulary. Well, reading's a good way, isn't it? If uh, you read in English, I don't recommend that you write down every single word that you don't understand because that kind of takes the pleasure away from reading a little bit. But when I read in Spanish, there are some words that I keep noticing. I notice a word, I think, well, what, what does that word mean? And then I continue reading, and then I see the word again, and maybe I see the word again. And then it starts to bother me, Kim, well, let's start, what does this word mean? So I go to the dictionary, I check the meaning, I write it down. So what I would suggest is words that really... Uh, keep repeating themselves and begin to get your interest. What does this word mean? They're the ones that are appearing a lot. And I suggest they're the ones you need to write down and try to remember. Any other ideas, Reza? Yes, there's an app uh, on uh, computers, on mobile phones, uh, called Memrise. You can, well, you can get it online on the computer or you can download it as a map. And basically, they're like digital flashcards. Mm -hmm. Now, a flashcard, uh, the original flashcard, is what it says, a card, like a hard piece of paper, a card, which you flash. To flash means to see something quickly or to show something quickly. So you flash it. So imagine I want my students to say the word apple. Imagine we're talking about fruit. I say, how many fruits can you remember? And I quickly show them this picture of an apple and quickly and put it away again. And I want them to say as quickly as possible, apple. 
So that's the that's the idea behind the invention of of flashcards. You can put other things on it, but that's basically the idea. And then in the old days, you used to have the picture of the apple on one side, and then the word written on the back with maybe the pronunciation. So you'd get the students to say the word, and then if they couldn't remember, you'd turn it quickly. Do you remember? And then yeah. turn it back yeah. again. Let them see it. Just flash it to them really quick, and then see if they could remember. So Memorize does something similar, doesn't it? But it's digital, so it does it inside the app. What's the, what's the address for that Memorize place online, Craig? Yeah, it's uh, memorize.com, M-E-M-R-I-S-E.com. It's a free app. It's very, very good. And it has word lists based around topic areas, but you can also create your own word lists. And you can either work with your students, Tanya, with your class or the students can use it independently for self-study. And I'll put the links in the show notes at uh, inglespodcast.com slash 155. Uh, a much more basic, more basic even than a flashcard uh, method is simply writing the word, writing the word in letters on a post-it, one of those little pieces of paper which you can stick, pegar, stick, on something that's what i used to do to learn spanish posits, uh, posits in, in spanish is it posit 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 in english it's a it's a post-it because you stick it a bit like posting something online you post it you stick it on the object so on my uh cupboard i posted a little piece of paper stuck a piece of paper that said armario so that I would remember that every time I went to open my cupboard, that in Spanish it was armario because I saw the word. I did the same thing. You yeah. can you can do it. You can do it in English. Of course, you don't really need that for higher levels, but for lower levels, it's brilliant. For lower levels of English, I don't know, up to maybe about B one or something like that. From about B two, intermediate, upper intermediate level onwards, it probably isn't that helpful. But for lower levels, it's great. You could use it for high levels. For example, if you bought, if you buy a new fridge and it's, it was quite expensive, you could write a post-it in English, an exorbitantly expensive fridge, and make the sentence more complicated with uh, advanced adjectives, for example, and then stick that on the fridge. And it's just a visual way of reminding you on a daily basis, every day reminding you um, about these new words, expressions and phrases, etc., you could do it with idioms. You could do it with anything. What do you think, Craig, about testing yourself, testing your knowledge of vocabulary? Well, there's a very good um, website and app called Duolingo. That's free. Um, you may have heard of it. You can find that at uh, duolingo.com. That's D-U-O-L-I-N-G-O. And that app is available on iOS devices. So that's iPad, iPhone, etc. And also on Android. If you have an Android phone, you can register with Duolingo. It's very good for vocabulary. And that's another recommended app. You can also, of course, use mnemonics and memory tricks to remember words. And Tanya, perhaps you know this, that if you try to connect a word in the language you're learning, in, in our case, you're learning English, for example, uh, try to connect that with something you know in Spanish, make some kind of visual connection in your mind to help you remember. I remember years ago, uh, I learned the word Rathaus in German because it's spelled R-A-T, Rat, and Haus, H-A-U-S, and it means town hall, Aitomiento. So I remember, I, I have in my mind a picture of a very big house with rats running out of it. And because I remember the rats running out, I connect that with the house of the rats, the town hall. And that's my way of remembering that word. And the more absurd, the more extreme, the funnier way you, you create this image, the easier it is to remember so you could use anything to make that mental picture and connect the English word with something you know in Spanish. So all of these are good uh, techniques to remember vocabulary. But if you want to learn new vocabulary, and the main thing you have to do, Tanya and everybody, is read and listen and get involved in conversations with native speakers. And that way you will come across new 
vocabulary. What does come across mean? Listening. Come across is toparse con. It's the only way. You will come across words and phrases which are not very useful. If it's obvious they're not very useful, well, you don't need to pay them much attention. But if you notice, as Craig said earlier, certain words in books or articles or even when you're listening, repeating, well, then you can come to the conclusion that they're common, they're important, you need to know them. And you'll you'll start taking notice. And through repetition, that will help you start the process of remembering them. And there are some words maybe that you just like the sound of or they're funny or amusing to you. So if you hear Reza and I um, say a word later when we're speaking about um, farming and vocabulary and you like the sound of it, you, you want to use it, then uh, write down the word or go to the show notes, see the word, write it in a notebook or on your mobile phone and build a list, create a list of new and interesting words in English that you can then uh, incorporate and grow your vocabulary. Maybe I'm a bit old fashioned, but I'm quite obsessed with the idea of writing uh, words that you want to try and remember. Not every day, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but from time to time, by hand, because I've read a lot of research about this carried out by psychologists what and carried neurologists. Out, carried out? Carried out, conducted by psychologists, psychiatrists, neurologists, people like that. Mm -hmm. In America particularly, they study it a lot. And they have pretty much proven beyond doubt that there's no better way to remember language than new language than to write it down by hand. And yes, by hand is important. They discovered that even the most hardcore, the nucleo duro, even the most hardcore computer geeks who spend their entire lives on computer, they did experiments with them and they discovered that if they forced them to write things down by hand, even the geeks remembered those things better than writing it on their iPad. There's some special connection obliging your hand to write something by hand. Mm -hmm. The message travels from your brain all the way down your arm. It physically has to get there to the tip of your finger. You write it, it goes back again, it registers. And that really, really um, stabilizes the memory. It really uh, like cements it in there much more than just typing on a, on a keyboard. Because if you type on a keyboard or a screen, you're looking at individual letters. Whereas if, when you write a word by hand, you see the connection between all the letters and they've discovered that this really reinforces vocabulary retention. I, um, I, I agree with Reza 100% and I would definitely recommend a physical vocabulary notebook, notebook just a small one with a pen or pencil in your pocket, in your bag uh, every, every day and just keep looking at it when you're standing in a queue and um, keep adding to it as you come across or find new words. But of course, some people are more comfortable with mobile phones and I think it's better to use an app on the phone or make a, a digital list on your phone than not do anything. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, we recommend using physical paper and pen, but if you don't like writing, if it's a, a problem remembering a physical notebook, then of course, using your phone or a tablet is better than nothing. Greg, I think we have more feedback, this time from Australia, of all places. Yes, we're going down under. We're going to the opposite side of the world now to hear from Juan, originally from Argentina, who's living in Australia. Here's Juan. Hello, guys. How are you? It is Juan from Argentina. At the moment, I'm working in Australia as an agriculture engineer and I was wondering if you can talk about farming stuff. Currently I'm working with tomatoes, corns, garlics and carrots. Uh, yep. Yeah. On another hand I would like to say thank you uh, and I would like to say congratulations as well <clears throat> because you are doing an excellent job. Um, You've been, I've been listening to this podcast the last few weeks and I cannot stop to do that. It's, it's 
is because the podcast is really, really good. Thank you very much. Um, have a good one. Thanks, Juan. It was really good to hear from you all the way from Australia. Um, any comments, Reza? Uh, thanks very much, Juan. Your English was very good. But I did notice one little grammar error. You said that you can't stop to do, to listen, you meant. You can't stop to do. And that's wrong. What should he have said, Craig? Can't stop listening or can't stop doing? So it's right. can't stop plus plus gerund. Plus ing. Stop plus ing, not infinitive. So you can't stop listening. But you can say, you can use the infinitive after stop. You can say, I stopped to smoke a cigarette. Right. But that's a, that's a different meaning. It is, but it's possible. It's correct. And it means, for example, Juan's on his tractor in Australia. He's driving his tractor. After four or five hours, he's tired. So he stops to have a rest or he stops to drink some water. So you interrupt what you're doing to do something else. So it has a different meaning. Juan, thanks very much for your, your feedback and, and, and keep on listening. And as I've said before to other listeners, your wish is our command. As the genie said that came out of the bottle, the magic genie, what you wish for, you get, you want us to talk about farming and agriculture, then we will. So uh, if you leave the door open, you know, some people come into a room, they open the door, they, they don't close it. Some people go into a house, they might leave the front door open. In our building, where we live in our flats, our neighbours are constantly going out of the building and not closing the front door, the security door. That really annoys me. An expression you could use in English to someone who does that is, were you born in a barn? Close the door. Were you born in a barn? And what is a barn? A barn is a building on a farm, granero in Spanish. Have you ever been to a barn dance, Reza? Have you ever been to a dance in a barn? No, but I'd love to go. Me too. I'd love to. That would be like a typical kind of country traditional dance, very rustic, yeah? Yeah. That'd be nice. What's the word for cows and oxen? Oxen are buey in Spanish. Um, is there a word we could use in English for a, a collective noun for cows right. and oxen? Imagine I'm a farmer and I have 50 cows. I could say, I have 50 cattle. The cattle means the group of cows. Notice the plural of ox is uh, an exception because normally to make a plural in English, you add an S, but with the word ox, two or more ox are oxen, E-N. Ox isn't, isn't a thing which you hear mentioned a lot in British cooking, although there is one exception, oxtail soup. Mm -hmm. Do you like that? No, I don't, but it's very common, isn't it? Yeah. Oxtail soup, la sopa de la cola d'un bois is a traditional British soup. So cows and oxen, cattle, and there's a similar uh, collective noun for chickens and turkeys. Turkeys are pavos. What do you call chickens and turkeys in English? Poultry. That's P-O-U-L-T-R-Y. So cattle and poultry, two things you might find on a farm. Also livestock, which in Spanish I think is ganado. So that could be cattle and poultry. Anything alive yeah. is livestock. Or even horses that work on the farm or donkeys or anything, right? Pigs. Dairy. D-A-I-R-Y. Anything made from milk is dairy. Perhaps in Spanish, vacaria. Would you say that? I've never heard it before, but it, it makes sense. Lecheria would be the shop or the store where you'd find dairy products or dairy produce. Producto lacteo. So... Not milk, eh? Dairy is the word in English. Milk. Yeah, because it also includes cheese, yogurt, right. that kind of thing. Do you like dairy products, Craig? I do. I love Spanish cheese. I love... Manchego, uh, lovely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah My too. favourite is from the north of Spain. Idiazabal. Idiazabal Oh, cheese. I love that one as well. It's, it's from the Basque country, isn't it? Yeah, it's very yeah. smoky. It's quite strong. I love Idiazabal cheese. I'd be interested to know about cheeses from our Central and South American listeners. Is there a tradition of many dairy products, cheese, milk, uh, yogurts in your country? We don't know much about that. 
There, there's some good cheese in Argentina where Juan's ah, working at the moment. Yeah, right. Argentina's uh, got some great cheese. Of course, cheese. you've been there. Yeah. You've been there, right. Mm-hmm. I heard a joke once which I thought was very funny. Uh, I don't mean it in a racist way. It's just, it's just very funny. Um, apparently, the United States is the country with probably the greatest diversity on earth. It's very diverse. It's muy diverso. You name it, they've got it. Most diverse country on earth, and they can't even make one decent cheese. I think it was a French person I heard saying it. It's yeah. true. They yeah. don't make one single interesting cheese in the whole of the United States. How can it be? They've American, got everything. American cheese is famous for being tasteless. It's that yellow tasteless cheese that you find on hamburgers in McDonald's. Yeah. And of course, there's the other extreme, the comment, I think it was from General Charles de Gaulle. He was having some kind of political crisis when he was control- in charge of France. And they said, oh, why can't you control the country? And he said something like, no one can control a country with 600 types of cheese. It's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> he literally said that. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Moving on uh, to another word um, based on farming and agriculture, crops. C-R-O-P-S. Cosecha or cultivo. You could say, for example, we had a bad crop corn crop this year or maize is an important crop what's corn corn is um maize and what's maize maize it's the same it's the same thing isn't it it's the same corn thing. and maize is the same thing one of them looks like spanish maize kind of looks like maize doesn't it yep yep but, but corn means the same more or less but corn is sometimes also used for sweet corn ah. a corn on the cob we'd say in english corn on the cob c-o-b and that's quite common here in Marvarosa. You see them selling it on the beach oh. here, corn, uh, sweet corn on a barbecue. Quite Ooh, nice. That. So if crops is cosecha, what is crop rotation? Uh, rotacion de la cosecha, I suppose, which means. <laughs> <laughs> the pra- brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. The practice of rotating, in other words, changing the use of different fields from crop to crop each year. Why do they do that? To avoid damaging or exhausting the soil. So, for example, they might grow one year um, corn in a field and then the next year potatoes. Because, you see, each crop, whether it's corn, potatoes, carrots, whatever, take certain nutrients out of the soil. Yeah. Out of the ground. Like potassium, for example. Yeah. And, yeah. Different things. But each crop has its own uh, particular needs. Mm -hmm. So if you keep using the same crop, you will deplete, you will exhaust that ground of certain minerals. Whereas if you keep rotating, uh, then you won't exhaust certain minerals out of the ground. Right. Mm -hmm. So we said crops was uh, cosecha, but another word for cosecha could be harvest, but it's not the same. The verb to harvest, cosechar, is to collect what you have grown when it's ready. It's a collection collected. of the crops, really, isn't a it? Co- exactly, a collection of the, of the crops. So it can be a noun, a harvest. For example, the corn harvest this year was very, very successful. Or, of course, it can be a verb, cosechar. We have to harvest next week. We have to harvest the crops did you know that this winter um, the harvesting of lettuce has been disastrous? I didn't know that. Why Why is that? Because Be- of the weather? Yeah, because of so much rain in Spain. And I didn't know this, but I found out from talking to my mom and other people that what happened was the price of lettuce in the UK has doubled and tripled this year. Because yep. they weren't importing Spanish lettuce? Yeah, because so much of the of the harvest, so much of the, the crop, uh, the lettuce crop got ruined that it made prices increase dramatically in the UK. I didn't know that. Yeah, two and three times. Because I haven't price. noticed salads being more expensive in, in Spain. In Spain, yeah, but in Britain, but in because Britain. they have to import them. So the Spanish kept a much higher percentage for themselves because they lost so much of the harvest. So the price of exports doubled and tripled so yeah. this year the lettuce crop wasn't a bumper harvest what does that mean Not a bumper all. harvest a bumper harvest a very good harvest Una muy buena cosecha. so this year it was the opposite it was a disastrous harvest for lettuce Where 
Lorenzo, you like a, a drop of wine from time to time? A drop is a, a gutter. Yeah. That's uh, being a little bit sarcastic. <laughs> a drop, more than a drop of wine occasionally. A, a, glass. a glass. What's a cosecha de vino? How would you say that in English? Cosecha ah, de vino. Now that's a different word, not harvest, but vintage. When it's wine, we say vintage for cosecha. Yeah. So we're thinking about the vintage. Uh, includes the idea of the fact that the year is important. Certain wines are, are better in certain years. So if you're looking uh, for a Dom Perignon, 1998 might have been a lot better than 1995, for example, or vice versa. It depends on the, on the vintage of the wine. And we've spoken about the idea of harvesting crops from the field, but there's another, another verb you can use when you take fruits or flowers uh, from trees or from the ground. You can use the verb to pick, P-I-C-K, escoger or coger. So you can pick flowers, for example, pick flowers in the spring. You can pick fruit from the trees. You can pick grapes from the vine, V-I-N-E. That's where grapes grow in a vineyard and they grow on a vine, not a tree. And you pick fruit and uh, and flowers. You can even pick peppers. In fact, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Did Great. you know that? Yes, I did. Uh, uh, what, what happened to that peck of pickled peppers? The peck of pickled peppers that Peter Piper picked. I can't remember. I, I can't remember what happened to them either. <laughs> I can't remember. You can also pick your nose, which is a bit disgusting, but people do it sometimes. How do you say secchia? In English, when there's no rain, there's no water, the opposite of what happened this year in Spain. That would be a drought, D-R-O-U-G-H-T, drought. Did you know that Spain imported water by ship in 2008? I didn't know that. Yeah, I saw it on the news at the time, I remember, yeah. I, I didn't remember that, that uh, there was a, a drought, a drought in the northeastern part of, of Spain in Catalonia. So it was so bad in 2008 that, that water had to be imported from France. And I didn't know that. Apparently about 70% of water in Spain goes to, to agriculture, to irrigation, to watering the crops. Soil, S-O-I-L, tierra, is, uh, is a common word in agriculture and in farming, partly because of erosion, because you can have soil erosion, can't you, where the water sometimes washes the soil away or moves it from one place to another place. That's a big problem for, for farmers. You said soil was tierra. Tierra. How do you say land in Spanish? The same. Tierra. So is soil and land the same? No. What's same word in Spanish. So soil is usually brown or red or reddish brown. It's that material which is in the, in the ground. Whereas land just means anything that you can walk on is the land. Land means not sea. Right. Sea and land, yeah. 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 Whereas soil is the actual physical material that the land is composed of, right? That green, sorry, that reddish, brownish material, yeah. But very often there's green grass on top of the soil, but the soil is underneath, right? And there's an interesting use of this in, in Spanish. My neighbor is constantly uh, aware that I'm English, and he says to me things like, uh, uh, Fue muy mal tiempo ayer en tu tierra. So I wouldn't say in your land in English. I'd say in your country. Mm. In your country it was bad weather. But it, it, it is used in a slightly old-fashioned or, po or poetic way, though, isn't it? The word land to mean country. For example, I come from a land down under. Does that ring a bell? Australia. Yeah. <laughs> the land down under, yeah. It is used. Where Juan is now, hopefully listening to us. Driving his tractor. Maybe you're listening to us. If you're feeling a bit homesick, he might be in Australia looking out the window, or maybe he's on his tractor avoiding kangaroos, but he's, he's eating a dulce de leche. <laughs> maybe he's mixing up Australia and Argentina. Dulce de leche, kangaroos and tractor, maybe. Yeah. Juan, I, I don't know. What a, rom what a romantic picture. Speaking of the word land, as we were, what does a, what's a fertile land? F-E-R-T-I-L-E. -E. If you have a, a fertile land that you're farming, what does that mean? Well, we are in fertile land right now, El Levante. That 
eastern area of Spain is extremely fertile. They often get two, three, and four harvests a year yeah. of particular crops, whereas in other parts of Spain, they may only get one harvest mm -hmm. because the land's very fertile. If land is fertile, it gives a lot of good harvests. And from the adjective fertile, we can also make the verb to fertilize. Fertilizar, which means to give fertilizer, which is the noun, to the land. So three words there, fertilize, fertilizer, and fertile. Fertilizer, Craig, can be, can be artificial chemical fertilizer or natural fertilizer. Which do you prefer? Well, you know, I'm more of a natural boy, so I'd probably prefer human waste or animal waste ah. to, uh, to chemical waste. A natural fertilizer. How do you, uh, how would you say in farm speak or farm talk when you give water to the land so that the plants and crops grow? Irrigation. Which is similar in Spanish, isn't it? Irrigación. Irrigation. Yeah. yeah. To irrigate the fields means to give it water. Did you know that the irrigation system here in the Valencia area is very, very old? I think it goes back to when the Moors lived here. Yeah. They, they built it. And it's still in yeah, use today. It's, it's still in use. Yeah, if you go out it's to the fields just outside of uh, Valencia here to places where they, they grow crops, you can see the old Arabic uh, irrigation system still working. Craig, what's an orchard? An orchard is a collection of trees that have fruit. For example, an apple orchard, a collection of trees that uh, where apples grow. Or you could have a cherry orchard, you know, a place where you'd find cerezas, cherries. When I was a boy, I used to sneak into a, a, a private garden near what my did, house. What does sneak into me? I used to sneak into, I used to illegally and suspiciously enter. And quietly, I presume. Yeah. And occasionally we would get chased away. And the reason we went there, because there was an apple orchard and we'd go and steal the apples and eat them <laughs> there and then. Did you ever get caught? We got chased, but never caught. <laughs> you we got chased. Caught. Yeah. <laughs> And the apples were terrible. They were very, very... Um, sour? Sour, agria. They weren't really ripe. Ripe is maduro. R-I-P-E. They weren't ripe. They were a bit sour. You can spray chemicals onto crops to make them ripe, to make them grow quicker, to kill insects. And that's pesticide, using pesticides to, to spray the crops. I, I'm guessing you don't like the use of pesticides. Me? No, Craig knows I'm quite quite into, that means I'm interested in, kind of organic farming and natural farming and food. That interests me a lot. So I'm quite opposed to the idea of chemical pesticides myself. Mm -hmm. I prefer natural pesticides. There are natural pesticides. For example, you can use certain plants to kill other plants, or you can use insects to kill other insects. Yep. Yeah, I've heard of that. Hey, Craig. Hey, Reza, how are you doing? No, I know. I mean, what is hey? <laughs> oh, hey. Hey, you. H-A-Y, not H-E-Y. H-A-Y is henno, dried grass. So hay is dried grass, the sort of thing you'd feed to horses. So what's a hay bale or a bale of hay? Paca de heno, when you collect it together in a, in a big lump, a big piece. You don't see a lot of that in the Valencia area, do you? There mustn't be no, a lot of hay around I, here. I don't think it's grown around here, but I think you might come across, you might see straw, which is paja. It's straws when it's dried, when it becomes dry and hard. Yeah. Hay is soft. So hay you feed to animals and yeah. straw you use in the barn for bedding. For bedding, yeah. It's harder. Yeah. yeah. Every year in order to aerate the land, to put air into the land, you have to turn over the earth, the soil, with a plough, P-L-O-U-G-H. Strange spelling, plough, means arar, to plough the field. So what do you do after you've ploughed the field? What's the next step? Uh, the next step is you prepare it for planting. I'm sure Juan knows better than I, but you have to kind of break up the big pieces of earth, you have to flatten it, you have to create seed beds, same word, bed, comma, and you have to prepare the field 
into a, a situation where you can plant the, the seeds into the soil. You can say plant or sow, yeah, S-O-W. Sow would be sembrar, isn't it? Yes, to sow seeds. Seeds are semillas, to sow seeds. There's a common expression in English, to sow the seeds of doubt or the seeds of unrest. Doubt is duda, rest is inquietud. Sembrar la duda, or sembrar el panico, things like that. And there's another expression, you reap. What you sow to reap is segar or, or cosechar, to, to collect in the things that you put out. So you reap what you sow means what you give or what you contribute, you get back in return. But that's used as an idiom in quite a negative way, isn't it? If, if something bad happens because you did something bad, you say, well, what do you expect? You, you reap what you sow, you, you get back what you put in. But we don't want that to happen to you, listeners. We want you to reap the rewards of listening to our podcast. Uh, the more podcasts you listen, the better your listening will become. Believe us, you will reap the rewards. You will benefit from all the work. Keep listening to the podcast and see how your listening improves. And uh, that's a great opportunity for us to mention our sponsor, italki, because to reap the rewards with a private teacher using italki means you can uh, connect with a private teacher on their website and you can practice your English one-to-one -one at a time that's good for you and uh, at a price that's right for you because there's a, a huge selection of different teachers on italki with different accents and, and nationalities and, and cultural backgrounds. So we have an arrangement with italki and they're offering a hundred free credits for you if you register through our website. Um, so go to inglespodcast.com slash italki, give it a try, see what you see what you think. Please give us your feedback. Tell us if you had a, a good experience. Reza and I have tried them and we we both had good experiences from their service. And we want to say thank you to our talkie for sponsoring Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig. So we said before, Reza, that to reap the rewards or to reap what you sow are both idioms connected to farming and agriculture. Can you think of any more idioms we could use connected to farms and, and farming? There are quite a few common idioms, actually. For example, to farm something out. So a phrasal verb, to farm out. That's to send work to someone to be done away from one's normal place of business. In other words, to subcontract. So, for example, I usually edit these podcasts, but um, maybe if I don't have any more time, I could pay a different person to edit these podcasts. So then I would farm out the editing. I would pay somebody to uh, be a subcontractor and do it for me, to farm out. Craig, have you ever been on a funny farm? <laughs> no, I haven't. That's... Uh, that's a, a not a very polite word or expression for a hospital uh, for people who are mentally ill. So if you have uh, maybe a psychological problem, um, an expression, the funny farm, means that it's uh, an institution for people with, with mental health problems. Be careful where you use this because it can be quite rude um, depending on your relationship with the person you're speaking to. An example would be, my grandmother had to send my uncle to the funny farm when she couldn't take care of him at home anymore. A more correct, more polite way of saying that would be, she had to send him to the, the mental asylum or hospital for the, for the mentally ill or something like that, which yeah. sounds much better these days. Yeah, it's a bit of a dated expression. Yeah. Be careful where you use it. Craig, do you know what? I'm pretty hungry. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. I'm you? starving, but a whole horse? Could you really eat a horse? Not really, not really. A few fillets of one, perhaps. <laughs> but it's just an idiom which means you're very, very hungry. You say, I could eat a horse. I'm very hungry. It's similar to, I could eat the leg of a table. We quite often say in Belfast as well for that. I wouldn't really eat a whole horse and I wouldn't really eat the leg of a table. 
Although my mum's cooking sometimes uh, tasted like a leg of a table. Reza, you know I love podcasting. In fact, I could probably podcast until the cows come home. What does that mean? Me too. For a very long time. Until the cows come home. I guess it comes from the idea that cows go out to pasture, to pasture to the green fields, to eat, to pasture. The to pasture. Eat, eat grass, yeah. Son los pastos, right? The green yeah. field. And they come home to the barn or wherever they're going to sleep very late at night or when it's dark. So uh, they're away for a long time. So when something is for a long time, it's until the cows come home. You know, we've got quite noisy neighbours. Uh, in fact, they've been quite noisy during the recording of this podcast. But uh, yesterday they had a party until 3 a.m. in the morning. And I'm so fed up, Arto. I'm so annoyed with the noisy neighbours. And yesterday was the last straw. So we said before that straw was pacha. If something is the last straw, it's the final thing that really makes you completely angry and you do something. So when they had a party until 3 a.m., it was the last straw, I finally called the police. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. That's the, a proverb, isn't it? Yeah. Is it from the Bible? I can't remember. Wherever it comes from, the last straw is the straw that breaks the camel's back. If you imagine a camel with a very heavy load and you put just a little bit too much on, just one more straw and boof, its back's broken. It's too much. It can't tolerate anymore. So the last straw or the final straw is another idiom. Reza, we're, um, we're in pretty good health. We're in pretty good shape, but we're, we're no spring chicken, are we? We're not spring chickens. You what does that, that mean? Again. Yeah. <laughs> What's a spring chicken? A young person. Yeah. A young person. So... It's usually used as a negative, isn't it? You usually say that someone is not a spring chicken. They're not young. It's a nice way of saying they're, they're old. We said before that hay, H-A-Y, is heno. And there's an expression, there's an idiom that's to make hay while the sun shines. What does that mean, Reza, if you make hay while the sun shines? Well, farmers know that it's the best time to make hay is when it's sunny. In other words, they take the opportunity to do something when the time and conditions are right in the summer when it's sunny. This is in, in Britain because, you know, it rains a lot in Britain, particularly in winter, and it would be useless to make hay then. So you've got to do it at the right time. There's a nice expression in English which goes, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Basket is cesta. So eggs, as you know, can break quite easily. You've got to be careful with them. So if you put all the eggs in one basket and you drop that basket, you've broken all your eggs, probably. So you should use more than one basket. In other words, don't make everything dependent on one thing. Don't like put all your hopes or all your possibilities in one small or concentrated area. Spread them around. That's good advice if you're investing money, isn't it? Because if you have extra money to invest... You don't want to invest in one company because if that company doesn't make money, you lose your money. The best thing is to diversify, to invest in different companies or invest in different shares, acciones. Then if, if one company has a problem, you haven't got all your eggs in the one basket, so you can still earn some money. Our final idiom is to take the bull by the horns which means to be brave and confront difficult situations. Bull is toro, uh, horns cuernos. So obviously if you take the bull by the horns, then you're confronting and dealing with a, a difficult situation. Can you think of an example? Yes. Craig's neighbours annoyed him for many, many, many days, but because he's such a polite British gentleman, he didn't want to bother them. But one day... They made so much noise that he couldn't sleep all night. And he thought, okay, I'm going to take the bull by the horns. I'm going to go up to them and tell them to shut up. <laughs> Had enough. And that's what he did. I took the bull by the horns. Also, if you're, if you're unhappy in your job, perhaps you... You go and speak to your uh, boss and you confront your boss. Like, I, I've had enough with this company, with the bad salary I'm earning and the extra hours I'm working. So you take the ball by the horns and you leave your company. You find a different job. Reza, 
there. So if you have you ever worked on a farm or or picked fruit in the summer or done any agricultural work at all? Uh, no, I haven't uh, picked fruit, but yes, I've worked on a farm. <laughs> yes, I've worked on a farm, not a farm. Yes, I've worked on a farm um, collecting hay bales in the United States. Which part of the US was it? In Maine, right up in the Northeast. Oh, beautiful, beautiful 16. part of the US. Did you enjoy the physical farm work? Not at all, because it was on that holiday that I discovered while while putting hay bales into a barn to store them is when I discovered that I have hay fever. It wasn't a good time to discover it. What's hay fever? Uh, Allergia al pollen. Uh-huh. Okay. If you translate it literally, it would be like fiebre de leno, but it isn't. It's allergia al pollen. But I discovered it while while stacking hay bales in a barn. Not a good time to discover it. No, you don't want to be there at that time. I was pretty did you, sick to say the least. Yeah. Did, did you drive a tractor while you were there? Uh, yes, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, how was that? It was good fun, yeah. It nearly ran me over, but apart from that, it was re- really good fun. <laughs> and uh, you said you, you'd like to see more organic farming. Why yeah. do you think non-organic farming is bad for us? Well, it's not necessarily bad for us, but I just like to know what's gone into my food. And I think in the long term, if we keep using too many artificial fertilizers and chemical pesticides, we could damage the land irreparably. That means we won't be able to repair it. And I'm a bit worried about that happening. So do you go out of your way? That means do you search specifically for uh, non-genetic, non-genetically modified fruit and vegetables? Do you, do you look for organic fruit and produce yeah. here in Valencia? Well, you're mixing two things there. Organic doesn't necessarily mean uh, non-GM. Okay. Something can be not GM, but it's not organic. Uh, GM True. is genetically modified. That means it is not a natural organism. It's mm-hmm. been created by man. It doesn't naturally exist in nature. And I'm per- particularly against that. That bothers me a lot more than the idea of using chemicals. I don't know if our listeners know that Spain is the number one producer in Europe of GM corn, for example, but it's hard to see it written on the label. Nobody really writes it. They don't really tell you. But I I object to the fact that they don't let us know properly what we're eating. One of the reasons I asked is that, uh, I mean, I'm all for natural produce and not using chemicals all four means i'm in favor of but um, tends to be more expensive and difficult to find and sometimes when i do find these kind of uh, fruits and vegetables they're, they're more expensive and they're not as good as tasty as uh, as other fruit and vegetables what the organic ones you think yeah it's good and tasty yeah okay. is that not your experience Usually the opposite. Mm -hmm. For me, an organic tomato is nearly always far, far better than a a non-organic one. I hated tomatoes, despised them until I was about 20 years old because I'd never eaten a natural one. I thought it was the most tasteless thing. I thought, why would anybody ever want to eat a tomato? I couldn't understand it, yet my mum forced me to eat them. Then when I was about 20, I went to live in Turkey, 23 or something, I went to live in Turkey and had a naturally produced tomato and it tasted like a tomato. And I thought, oh, this is a good taste actually, because it was organic. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't marketed as organic. It was just some Turkish guy had a bit of land where he grew tomatoes. And he probably couldn't afford the chemical pesticide. That's the the strange thing, that the the countries which are most organic are the poorest countries. In Africa, a lot of food is organic because they can't buy artificial chemicals. And it tastes better. It finally tastes better. It probably does, strangely, in poor countries. I'll have to get some addresses of supermarkets and shops from you and try try organic food again. That's all we've got time for, unfortunately, on on this podcast. So um, thanks very much for listening. And and let us know if you have worked on a farm, if you have picked fruit and harvested crops. Tell us about it. Let us know. Why not practice your English? You can send us a voice message, as Juan did, by going to speakpipe.com slash podcast, Or, of course, you can send us an email to me, Craig, at inglespodcast.com. Or to me, Reza at BelfastReza at gmail.com. And of course, our podcast would not be our podcast without our wonderful sponsors, who are Carlos, Thara, Mamin, Juan, Sara, Cory, 
Jorge, Raúl, Rafael, Manuel, Mariel, Maite, Pedro, Ana, Maria, and our latest sponsor, Nikolai. Thank you so much for your continued support. And if you'd like to join our list of sponsors, go to patreon.com slash Ingles podcast. And of course, we have to thank Arminda from Madrid, Reza. Which episodes uh, has she managed to transcribe for our listeners? So far, at the date of recording, she's done episodes 131, 134, 135, 136, 138, 139, and 140. So far. Thank you very much, Arminda. Thanks, Arminda. We really appreciate it. And uh, also thanks to Paco from Badajoz or Bajo for the idea of next week's uh, podcast speaking about holidays and travel because as Paco said we're coming up to our summer holidays so we're going to look at some holidays and travel expressions and vocabulary on next week's podcast until then it's goodbye from Reza and goodbye from Craig the music in this podcast is by Pitts the track is called see you later